more ways than one. It is really warm out there today. Just tapping out the river. The riders had to deal with soaring temperatures as they battled from Unley to Lindock. And it was who reigned again, winning the stage for the second year running. Dewitt is unbeatable at the moment. It was really stinking hot out there today. Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. It's a Wednesday. It is Stage 2 of the Santos Tour Down Under. The Staging Connection Stage 2. 26 degrees. Can you believe it? We're up around 43 yesterday, so very contrasting weather conditions. And there is Yasha Sutelen. He's a German, ironically, who rides for Spain. And uh, they must have quite a lot of uh, faith in him. When I say Spain, a Spanish team in Movistar. And they've signed him through to 2019. The gap at the moment is 4 5 and uh, he's out in front. Uh, whether or not he will be a sacrificial lamb come to a little later. There's Caleb Ewan at the head of the peloton just having a chin wag with the world champ. And of course they've been protagonists the last few days and uh, Caleb's come out on top of course on stage one and in the People's Choice Classic. With that we welcome Phil and Paul and uh, Yasha Sutherland, the, uh, the Movistar rider out in front. Uh, sacrificial lamb maybe because it's that kind of day. It's one of if not the toughest ever stage we've seen. I think it could well turn out to be a very tough day. They've got off to a cracking start. Remember yesterday in the heat, it was a little slow ride, but today they've gone very quickly. Interesting, man who won yesterday, Caleb Ewan. Paul, he's been working at the front of the peloton all day in the Oka jersey. Well, it's horses for courses, isn't it, really, Phil? Uh, because when we start to look at the profile of today's stage, we are really in for a showdown of the men who want to win this bike race overall. Yes, Caleb Ewan, a fast man over 100 mm. metres, but not necessarily over 100 metres going uphill. <laughs> yeah, and it's a beautiful spot here in Paracombe, just highlighting the contrasting places that we go to over the course of six days of racing. And it uh, really is a wonderful festival and a very varied festival from those temperature changes to the changes in terrain. Look, the race has now been going for 19 years. Absolutely superb race this. It's caught the imagination of the bike riders. Really, the whole season's now been changed because of this event. The season starts right here in South Australia in the month of January. It used to start in March in Europe. And the weather, well, yesterday was the one reason they, they were always worried this race would not succeed. It'd be too hot. It was 42, 43 degrees. Today it's 20 degrees cooler. It's perfect today. The crowds have come out. The crowds have come out and uh, that little bit of uh, wind in the air is also going to make it a little bit grip as we start to uh, get to the approach to this final climb of the day where we will see a big showdown of the guys who want to win this bike race overall but it's going to be extremely important to be in the right position in the main field when you get to the bottom of this climb. All right, we'll uh, dissect exactly what you guys think will happen here for stage two in just a tick but let's uh, look in the rearview mirror. Let's look at the highlights of stage one. Postwork stage one from Unley to Lindock signaled the first official stage of the Santos Tour Down Under and a chance for the sprinters to shine. In scorching temperatures, Belgian Lawrence de Vries sprinted away after just two kilometres and led on his own for the next two hours. The extreme heat meant the course was shortened, but the Astana rider couldn't hold off being caught by the peloton. And there we finally have the catch, Lawrence de Vrieza back in the group. And as the Italians will now say, Gruppo Compatto. 
Jay McCarthy signalled his intentions of going for the overall title by securing the second sprint of the stage. And then the race for the finish line began, with all eyes focused on last year's Stage 1 winner Caleb Ewan and world champion Peter Sagan. Caleb Ewan in about 8th position and just on his left behind him, following him through is Peter Sagan. And he's just lost the wheel of Caleb Ewan. He's a bit more in the depth Sagan's of the peloton. It is Peter Sagan. He's broken. He's broken very, very early. That's caused an immediate panic here. His teammate Sam Bennis is locked onto his back wheel now. But this could be a man. Coming on the far right is Caleb Ewan. And Sagan realises it's all to no avail here. Van Poppel is also trying to come through. But Ewan is unbeatable at the moment. Yeah, you know, it was, it was really stinking hot out there today. And, uh, you know, I think everyone felt the heat. And uh, it was probably a good idea for the race to shorten a little bit because, you know, we're just rolling around out there in the sun and, and it can't be too good for you. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm super happy to get that win. It was, it was a really close one in the end. Well, there he is, the, uh, the boyish looks of Caleb Ewan, but he's a powerhouse of a man on a push bike. He's doing what he does best, and that's win sprints, and he's on top of his form just now, beating the, all the sprinters in this race, Van Poppel, Benic, Gump, Bonifacio, uh, Nick, uh, Nicky's aunt. Uh, I think that, uh, yep, he's a great sprinter, but, you know, he's not going to win the stage today because, quite frankly, it is just uh, too hilly for him today, and I think that's why we're seeing him work so hard at the front. I think when you look at the uh, top 10 from yesterday's stage, I think we're going to see a completely different roster of names at the end of today's stage. Well, as we look at today, there is a, as a breakaway, Yasha Sutherland from Movistar, mm -hmm. and this is obviously part of uh, their science, the, uh, part of their plan. Yeah, we've, we've talked a lot as we take another peek into the race. These are live pictures again, and remember that uh, Sutherland is quite a long way ahead of this field. There he is now, you're right, he's got the M on his shorts. Movistar Paul, we haven't talked, this is a plan by Movistar, and they've got good riders. They've got riders who will appreciate this final climb of the day, uh, but this lone leader, he's currently still looking at 99 kilometers to go down towards the finish. But what it's doing as uh, we make uh, this little descent here, Phil, is it's actually keeping a lot of pressure on in the main field, and I think that will uh, suit the big climbers down towards the end. And you, you have to wonder which of the climbers is the one who's going to get superiority at the end of this day. Yeah, we're early days. This is the Staging Connection Stage 2 of the Santos Tour Down Under. We'll be back in just a tick. day for stage two of the Santos Tour Down Under from Stirling to Paracombe, this gruelling 148.5 kilometre stage of the Santos Tour Down Under. It's been said a few times so far this could really say something about the GC today, very early in the week. Usually it's Wollonga Hill that we point to every Santos Tour Down Under, but today is a little bit different. It is a bit different, it's a lot different if the truth were known because what's going on now as we as I have seen the live picture, the peloton's basically together, we've got one rider from Movistar in the lead and we're now on lap number three of five vicious laps before we get out into the country. Yeah, what we are going to start to see is a lot more of the strategies unfold as the riders try to place their uh, overall contenders towards the front of the pack. You'll see the, the team strategies, the different jerseys uh, acclimatizing towards the front of the main field to try and set up the positioning and that's what's going to be extremely important probably in the last 20 or 30 kilometres of today's stage. Well, we've been saying tough, we've been saying gruelling. Let's look at some of the nasty elements as we look at the track map for the stage from Sterling to Paracan. Well, this is it, 148.5 kilometres staging connection, stage two. We've been going to Sterling uh, since 09, I think it is, but now we're saying goodbye to Sterling after we've done five circuits ball. Then we have our journey through the Adelaide Hills across to Paracan. And those five circuits uh, base around Stirling to begin with are very difficult. There's hardly any flat on that course at all before they then pick up a high-speed descent away from Norton Summit to approaching 60 miles an hour before they then hit that final climb of the day up to the summit here at Paracon. All right, we've already had quite a race so far. Here's an update. 
Yeah, they got away surprisingly very, very quickly, but I think they were probably celebrating the fact it's 20 degrees cooler today when they got underway. Uh, no hitting the 43 degrees that we saw. So they left Sterling, but not for very long. They're on a 21 kilometre lap to be covered five times. Currently, as I speak, we're on lap number three, and the attack started. It was Cam Meyer, a 2011 winner of this race, and uh, on the attack straight away for Uni SA. Yeah, he was joined by Andre Sink, who's riding his first ever road race. He spent seven years as a mountain biker, turned professional uh, with his team there, Bahrain Merida, and after uh, a few kilometers, they got caught. But more importantly, as we uh, came to the end, the completion of uh, lap number one, everybody was lining themselves up for the first sprint point of the day and time bonus seconds available. That's right, this was a great sprint. We're only talking 3 2 and 1 second bonus. Uh, Caleb Yoon on the right tried to uh, steal a few seconds. When the photo was revealed, he didn't even get in the first three. It was taken out by the British sprinter on the new Bah Bahrain Meridia team, uh, Ben Swift. So he got the three seconds. But he is a sprinter, so that's not going to alter the overall uh, destination of the Ochre jersey. Yeah, great. Great to see Cameron Meyer back racing. Of course, he retired because of personal reasons, a past winner of this race, and wonderful to see him back today racing. Well, as we keep an eye on the race now with those live pictures on the right of the picture there, these riders now, I think, have a, most of them, they know the importance of the day stage. They know as they, they're going to have to work together now as teams because whoever wins, I think, might win the race overall today. The crowd will come out today. Know that they know the importance of this stage. You know, last year we got nearly 900,000 spectators. This year the atmosphere is so good. Wouldn't surprise me if we get to the million mark this year. I would expect that, especially when you look and uh, know how passionate today's stage is going to be. And uh, I just keep wondering what uh, the teams are going to do. Teams like Orica Scott, uh, they've got a two-pronged attack for today. Team BMC have got a two-pronged attack with Richie Port and, of course, uh, Rowan Dennis. But there are other teams queuing up behind who will try and take advantage of the matching of the tactics between those two teams at the top of the block. Yeah, and conscious of tomorrow as well, Glenelg to Victor Harbour, it's probably going to be way. a sprinter's finish, that one. May not then, be, Tim. Yeah? It's a tough... We're using finishing circuits for the first time mm. there and there's a little hill out on the course it could be an opportunist day but if you look at the live pictures at the front of the peloton there the gap is now representative of 2.7 kilometers so they're allowing uh, the movistar riders to run that's for sure because they know the nature of the course might crack him rather than the race itself i think the most significant thing is a yeah, yes orica scott are doing all of the work we expect that uh, to try and get simon gerens or chavez home first today but it's the speed they've been racing so quickly today. I thought because of the difficulty of today's stage, they might have taken it a little bit easier over the first couple of laps of Sterling, but that is certainly not the case. The, the tempo has been high since the start, and that's going to be a wearing down process uh, to try and weaken the defences of some of the other riders when they prepare for this final climb of the day. And I, I just keep wondering, for me, there's still that big question mark on Orica Scott. Who's going to be the leader? Is it Simon Gerens going for win number five, or is it their new kid on the block, Esteban Chavez? Well, in a couple of hours' time, we yeah, might know. we will, and it's going to be grinding and grueling, that last 2K. Mm. What about Peter Sargon? Where are you at there with the world champion? Can you ask that question in about three hours, and I might be able to answer it for but, you, Tim. There's little we don't point know. me asking that question, because you'll be in commentary telling us what he's doing. <laughs> I want your crystal ball at the moment with some sort of prognostication um, as I, to what he's going to be doing. Not like you, Paul, but I I'll think go. he's a little bit under his, under his best form, and he's not sprinting that well yet. Well, I have to disagree with you. I think Good. I think Peter Sagan is actually ride. riding pretty well. He's been riding well to help his teammates uh, so far in this race, but uh, when it comes down to a finish like this, I think if we see him close to the front at the end of today's stage, uh, I'm going to start to put his name down as a possible winner of this bike race overall. Mm, all right, can you guys agree on the temperature for the air conditioner because it's a bit, it's a bit cooler today? All right, no, not too yeah. many disagreements. Yeah, no, we don't like the AC. Mm, I'll let you roll. We've got some commentary to do. But let's have a look at the tour tracker because this is an opportunity for you to get the full bottle on what's happening with the Santos Tour down under. All the info on the on the riders, what countries everyone comes from because we really are a, a global event as you can see and all the latest information on the tour tracker and then you can get to Twitter of course. Hashtag ask Robbie TDU. We had some great questions yesterday and Robbie will endeavour to answer all of your questions. Just fly them through on Twitter. Big day stage two Santos Tour down under Sterling de Paracombe, it could break many and it could be very decisive as to who will wear the ochre at the end of this wonderful week. We're going to get to live commentary in just a tick. Here in 
scenic Stirling. The pure climbers with an ambition of winning the general classification, they need to maximise their chances by making the five laps of this tough circuit as hard as they possibly can, with an eye on attacking their depleted rivals later in the stage. After 110 kilometres of racing, the riders will have already done 50 kilometres of climbing. That will surely soften the legs for what is yet to come. Norton Summit is best known as a training climb for local Adelaide cyclists, but today they're heading in the other direction. It's a spine-tingling descent. This 14 kilometre downhill section will be the last chance the riders get to rest their legs, but it's no time to relax. It'll be single file through the hairpin turns and on the steeper open sections, the riders will be hitting speeds close to 100 kilometres an hour. After a short, flat transition, it's all uphill to the finish. The Gorge Road is another famous passage through the Adelaide Hills, but it's never been used in this direction in the finale of a stage of the Santos Tour Down Under. The damage done on the hilly Stirling circuit will now become evident. It'll be here you'll start to see riders crack and get dropped, with the best climbers coming to the fore, ready to tackle the final ascent. The Torrens Hill Road has been used once before in this race, but this time it's a completely new dynamic. The uphill approach on the Gorge Road will fatigue the legs even more, making the steep ramps of this final climb up to the finish line absolute torture. At an average gradient of 10%, the last 1.5 kilometres of this stage could be the most decisive of the entire race. Win here and you could be well on your way to winning the first UCI World Tour event of the year just like Rowan Dennis in 2015. This will be one of the best victories in Dennis's career. Great to have you company, Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. And just going through the hydration station is our Mobby Star leader, of course, Sutalan. And uh, he's doing well for his team right at the moment. It's a tough, tough stage, this one. Stage two of the Santos Tour down under for staging connections from Sterling to Paracom. And it's a big welcome, of course, to Santos Tour down under ambassador Jens Voigt. Jens, how are you, my dear friend? Happy New Year. How are you? I'm really good. I can't be more happy to be here. It's always great to come back to uh, South Australia and being part of the Tour on Under. I'm proud to be here. Yeah, well, you are an honorary Australian, of course. Now, you have had a chat with a few of the riders, in particular, had the chance to talk to Caleb Ewan, this pocket rocket, this 22-year-old superstar. He is, just like last year, had a fantastic start, winning the People's Choice Classic, winning first stage yesterday, taking yellow jersey. He wasn't too optimistic about defending his jersey. Hey, it's a tough stage today, but he's optimistic for his teammates that the Simon Gerrans might be up for the win today. He's got the Oka jersey on today, of course, uh, does uh, Caleb Ewan. He won't at the end, as we see a breakout. So, Bobby Star, this is all part of their plan, isn't it? For sure, as they have it all planned out, how they want to play this uh, game today, and hopefully, or at least they think, they hope they're going to have Simon Gerrans in the Oka jersey tonight. Would have been tough to recover from yesterday. We've gone from 42, 43 degrees, ice baths, everything else that was going on yesterday afternoon and into the night. And then today, completely contrasting conditions. Can you tell us a bit about that? It is super hard to recover from hot day like that. You just can't drink enough water to re rehydrate your body. And um, when I talked to riders and uh, different teams yesterday at the dinner, they all were happy about the decision to say, stop here. It was just cruel conditions out there. It's a little cooler today, so they feel, should feel a little fresher. And I expect some spectacular racing coming into the finish today. Yeah, it was a very sensible decision to drop one of those laps. Now, who do you think will feature today? A lot of the boys have been mentioning Chavez, Gerens, Richie Port, of course Rowan Dennis a few years ago, this is where he burst onto the scene with a win here. Well I guess today it suits more Simon Gerrans and his capacity um, and his team, but for the overall I still think Richie Port is the man to beat. Alrighty, we've got a lot of superstars here this year at the Santos Tour Down Under. Robbie McEwen had a chat with him on the start line, Rob. 
Uh, everybody seemed pretty happy amongst the riders. The talk was it was a great decision and everybody was, was pretty pleased with the, their welfare being put first. But you seem to get a big morale boost yourself because when the decision was made, you were the... Well, Jan Barkelons went first, but you were pretty quick to go on the attack in the final. Well, I like the heat and, um, you know, I love racing the heat. So for me... Uh, I wouldn't mind if we had made it longer, uh, but you know I have to speak for the riders' behalf. So and um, okay, you know, and uh, we're here to race. And also, it was uh, the, the the problem is when the race is hot and they do not think for the riders. You know, we do race uh, as a reflection of the weather, and the racing was not so exciting in that sense. So um, so by making the race shorter, we could do um, some extra things. And sure, you know, we're here to put a show on for the audience, and I don't mind to play around in the mix so why not Richie greeted today with much cooler conditions and a course more to your liking a lot of climbing Sterling and of course to Paracum this is one of the big days if not the biggest for you it uh, sure is Robert I mean t today it's I mean half the, the temperature of yesterday and some hills so really looking forward to just getting stuck in in training the form feels good so yeah today's a definitely a very hard stage and it's going to be a, a big effort for me but yeah, I thought yesterday the other GC guys are going for it so I needed to give it a go and yeah if I'm going to be in it at the end of the week like you said it can be come down to seconds so if I can pull it off today then maybe those seconds yesterday are um, very valuable later on. Uh, yeah we're really going to reassess things at the end of the day today if I can get through today without losing too much time I'll still be right in the race but I definitely can't afford to lose time today and again on Malunga. And on the other hand, you've got another, well, a great ally within the team, Esteban Chavez, a pure climber, so you've got a couple of options as well. Yeah, that's right. It's fantastic having Esteban here. Um, I think he'll be obviously very competitive today and again on Malunga, so if I can't go with the best guys on the on the climbs, I'm sure he'll be able to. Yeah, it's beautiful today. It's hard stage. And I think the, the guy who went the stage today is super close for winning the, the tour. Yeah, you can do also the difference in Wulunga, but today is more difference because all the stage is super hard. Wulunga you do two sports, but here today you did three hours sports, so it's important today, it's important for me, for the team. We all thought it would be such a pivotal stage, and, and you heard it from their mouths there, Jens. A lot of strategy, uh, a large focus on what's going to happen today from Sterling to Paracan. It is, and it's no secret that uh, Team Orica is here to win, to win today and also to win the overall. So, a bit of pressure on uh, Jero, but I think he's good enough of a teammate. If he feels, I don't have the legs today to actually make it, he's going to send out, uh, you know, young Chavez, and then he's going to take over. So, they are in a very good position with two equally strong leaders. Let's see um, how that works out today. Well, we're coming up to the sprint here again, and uh, there he is, Jan Sutelen. Uh, he is leading the way at the moment, a, a one-man breakaway, and uh, he'll be he'll be gathered up at some point. But right at the moment, uh, he has his team colours in lights on Broadway. This is the Santos Tour down under, Jens. Always good to talk to you. Thank you, my friend. All right. This is the Santos Tour down under. As the riders go through the hydration station, we will send you off to the break. Big day ahead. Make sure you stay with us on Channel 9's Wide World of Sports. As we look down here now, the gap has come back here to three minutes. Alongside me, of course, is Paul Sherwin. And uh, Paul, it's an interesting breakaway. And... The riders must know this kid, he's got some good results, uh, especially in stage races. Yes, he has, and I think what it's done, though, is it's made a, a very hard tempo in the main field, and that sets itself up uh, for a very interesting and exciting finale. It's a different approach to the finish line to the one we had uh, two years ago. In fact, it's a long, grinding, winding road until we hit up this final climb of the day, which has got gradients as steep as 10%. Yes, and the finishing climb is the brute, and we expect the real climbers to come and show themselves today. Looks like we might have Luke Rowe working hard down there for Orica Scott. For the Good Sky time. Team, I beg your pardon, yes. Orica Scott on my brain here because they've been blocking all day and it's Alexi Vermeulen, uh, the American rider, funny enough. It sounds like he's a Belgian. He's on the Dutch Lotto team. 
Yes, well, the, the Sky Riders, in fact, uh, they were very unfortunate to lose uh, one of their riders just before the start to Owen Doolder. We'd been told that he had uh, a stomach infection. Well, it turns out he, in fact, had appendicitis. And, in fact, he's now recovering in hospital, having had his appendix removed. So we wish him a, a hasty uh, he was recovery. Very lucky. He By was the sound very, of it, he was he lucky. Was very lucky to uh, be in the right place at the right time. And they, in fact, uh, flew down another rider to help out because uh, Kenny Ellison was training in uh, the northern part of Australia. And he's come down here because they really believe that their climber Sergei Anau has got a good chance of winning this race this year he finished third overall last year well he settled down the roads here are made for cycling I've always said that in the Adelaide Hills the Australian Institute of Sport bases in Adelaide their cyclists uh, both track and road all train in this region because the roads are so conducive quiet country roads for most of the time in the Adelaide Hills the famous uh, soft fruit, not just the uh, grapes, but also soft fruit capital here. The world champion on the front, so is he going to reveal to us just how well he really is going? His sprinting has been slightly off in the couple of races we've seen Peter Sagan take part, but today, you know, he's such a strong rider, the hill might not slow him down. We're going to find out as the race unfolds. Most interesting stage this. We're still on lap number four of five 21 kilometer circuits before we get uh, down to the end of the laps it is a very difficult lap there's no real flat road you can see the riders here all doing this the gap has come back slightly it was two and a half kilometers as you saw then it's back to 2.3 so they are closing in on him slowly but i don't think they're really chasing him down just yet not for the moment that gap hovering at around about the three minute mark uh, the difficult thing about this course here around sterling phil is uh, there is no flat at all you're either going downhill very fast or you're climbing up on the opposite side of the circuit for Sutherland, i think he's just got himself into a rhythm he knows there's going to be a reaction later on but you know this team at movistar they've got some very good climbers on board uh, jesus herada for example uh, gorka Izagiri and Victor de la Parte is also an excellent climber, but for the Colombians, uh, for the Spanish riders on this team, I think what they want is to have a tough race. The tougher the race is approaching this final climb of the day, the much better it is for their chances to open up the time gaps on this final ascent. So the peloton continues here. And they're looking as though they're all con think consolidated for when they go. Now, you know, when you have a world champion, a superstar on your team, well, Jay McCarthy is a man who's very proud to be on the same team as Peter Sagan. And he's ready, both willing and able to learn and to help the world champion. To have the world champion in the team, he's, uh, he's uh, not only the world champion because he's, he's one of the strongest riders in the peloton, but he's also one of the smartest. So to have him uh, keeping everyone calm out there is very important, and I think he can help me tomorrow with, uh, yeah, hopefully not teaching me how not to use so much energy and not, not to stress before the final. I was the, the going to probably be the GC man here to, this week, and um, I think tomorrow. Speaking with him, I think he'll possibly try and help me as long as I can to the, the final climb and look after me. So it's going to be pretty special to have the world champion hopefully looking after me tomorrow. And if he's feeling good, then we'll see, we'll see what happens out there tomorrow. Yes, well, uh, I don't know how you keep the world champion calm, but that's up to Jay. But Jay himself, uh, the team leader for Bora, he was fourth in this race and won a stage. In fact, his only win as a pro. And his stage that he won, Phil, was in fact in Sterling last year, which is uh, where the race is starting this afternoon. And he was really upset last year because it was uh, just for a handful of seconds that he finished, uh, he finished off the podium. And that's why I think we've seen him so very attentive in the early part of this race, looking for those time bonus seconds. And he's been uh, quite attentive early on. He got himself a two-second time bonus in the first sprint point of the day. He started the day in fourth place overall. And, well, you know, he has got great form. You have to show it today. There's no doubt that this race is made up of six days, but the riders know it's really two days when you have to excel if you're going to win it on Sunday in Adelaide. Today is the first day, and then fr uh, Saturday, the penultimate day, another hilltop finish. The overall contenders must ride today. I think they must finish within the top three or four. Ah, now we're practicing throwing the bidons into the basket net there now. No takers just yet. A bit early on the stage to throw your water bottles off, I must say. 
This is the race leader on the day, Jasko Sutelin. Well, for that matter, yes, he is the virtual leader on the road as well. Nice move for him. Now, normally when you get a one on the end of the numbers, it means you're the designated team leader. I'm not sure whether that is the case, but Sutelin has picked himself up the bonus on the second lap through the 66 kilometer point in the double I net uh, sprint at Heathfield. What's interesting there is, in fact, uh, the two riders are going across the line in, in second and third place, both from the Bora Hansgrohe team, and that's uh, Michael Kohler in second place and Rudiger Selig in third. I wonder if they were trying to uh, get their man, uh, Jay McCarthy, up there once again. But puts a lot of pressure onto the shoulders of Jay McCarthy, uh, having a man like uh, you the, the world champion, Peter Sagana, doing all of the uh, work for him. But at the end of the day, I still wonder how well Peter Sagan is going. And today at the finish line, we get a very good indication of how good the world champion's form is. We saw some good sprints here too. Some very good sprint winners, including Jay McCarthy, who is in the group today and looking to hopefully make a podium finish by the time we get to Adelaide. Today's his big day. He's, in, he's on Peter Sagan's Abora Hands Grower team. There's the grandstand. One more lap to come round yet. And the same man they've seen for the last two circuits is coming round for the third time. Uh, this is where we used to have the power hydration station. But uh, it's this roundabout, as far as I can work it out, where we will break to the right next time, as he now will continue on course. Well, this is just, uh, the riders are just having, uh, performing here. They're always bunny hop that roundabout every year. This is what you do when you grab your little food bag at high speed. It's like picking up the mail bag, isn't it, on the express train. Lovely, lovely crowd. Sterling hasn't let us down again. It's a lovely city to bring the race to. They're trying something different uh, this year by taking us across to the climb of Paracomb to finish. Uh, but the crowd actually have time to reach that finishing line if we go a different route. He's out on his last lap, Paul, lap number five. In the main field, again, Phil, they've, they've slowed down a fraction, spread out across the road. Uh, we're looking now at uh, 67 kilometres to go to the finish. That's uh, hovering around about the 40-mile mark. These guys, I, I think, are quite comfortable knowing that the lone leader is not going to be able to hold on to the majority of that advantage as we get down towards the finishing line. And I think they know by the fact that they've pulled him back to two and a quarter minutes at one stage. They can, once they get themselves organised on the approach to the uh, start of the climb, the final climb of the day, they will wipe out that advantage very quickly. No indication to know how these riders are feeling. They're all going to feel pretty nervous today. Those that want to win are, and that's probably as many as a half a dozen to eight riders who believe they can win this race on Sunday. It's a high number. This is Damien Hausen, who knows he's got two guys on his uh, Orica Scott team who can win, Chavez and Gerrans. Gerrans won it four times already, including last year. Kent, I think, I think Thomas again believes he can win also, and he is a good climber. This guy doesn't believe he can win, but he's no longer in the race to win it. The winner yesterday, Kelly Buen, he's constantly been coming to the front. This is the all-round bike rider. Is He's now got his new place on the team now, even though he's got the leader's jersey on his shoulders. And that is to help his two leaders, Chavez and Gerrans, be in the right place at the right time. Well, you've got to put it into perspective, really. It's a question of horses for courses, because uh, when you look at Caleb Ewan, uh, he's like the 100 or 200 meter sprinter in track and field. And uh, when you start to think about who's going to win the race overall, you've got to go more to the, the long distance runner, the 10,000 meter runner, or even really, you've got to start to think about the, the marathon cut distance. So everybody has their own uh, ability and their own disciplines in the sport. And Caleb Ewan is certainly proving to be the new sprinter on the block. Sutil in here, he's back to around about 90 seconds now. I think he wants to uh, probably get a drink or get a time check either way. He's called for his car. I just feel that uh, Movistar have come out with a plan. They wouldn't put a rider on their team up in the front like this if it wasn't to try and draw the sting. Well, 1.30 we were hearing, but that board is saying four minutes now, Paul. 
that's probably correct as well because when we looked at the main peloton they were spread out all across the road and there was no major chase happening and that's why we've seen this gap going up Great to have your company, Channel 9's Wild World of Sports, Santos Tour Down Under. And we're looking at the first of the two sprints we've seen so far. And the first one was a hard fought sprint. And then the second one, of course, Sutalan, he just got there. Now, the first one was uh, done well by Ben Swift. And the race for those uh, very important seconds was crazy. Caleb Ewan actually missed out. And the uh, guy that's won a few sprints over the course of time, Robbie McEwen. Uh, interesting, that first one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was to see everybody prepared to get up there and uh, have a sprint, especially on a stage that's going to be so tough towards the back end. And Jay McCarthy, as yesterday, very aggressive. He nipped off a couple more seconds in the background there as well. So all these riders know how critical these seconds are towards the overall classification. But I'll tell you what, this finish here in Paracom, that is going to sort them out. Yeah, it's a bit different. It's been talked up as the hardest of all stages of the whole Santos Tour down under. We're going back 19 years. Are you in that school of thought? I, I think it could be, but it all depends on how the riders go about it, what the teams decide to do, who wants to make the race very hard. It is a very difficult finish, that's for sure. They finished here two years ago, but this time they come from a different direction. But riders still prepared to go out on the attack. And what we often see on a stage like this, early attacks so around the circuit on Sterling, trying to get off the front and rely maybe on a bit of a Mexican standoff in the peloton behind and get let go or go on in search of getting some seconds. We see those early breakaways, maybe even a team like Movistar trying to force the pace and make the stage really hard, drain the legs of some of the other probably faster sprinters that also climb well, like a Simon Gerrans, by the time they get to this final hill, that's when they want to try and really pull the race apart. Yeah, a couple of years ago we saw Rowan Dennis, uh, he, he climbed up here as we were watching this descent and I asked him about Rowan in just a tick and... Well they'll be flying through the Adelaide Hills and you know, they'll have a descent down Norton Summit Road, they'll be touching speeds of up to 100k an hour today going down there, the bunch will be completely strung out, so it's also not just the hills that the riders need to worry about, but that downhill, if it splits you have to chase, waste energy, it can be quite dangerous, you know, the last thing you want to do is fall off going at those sort of speeds, so this stage really has a little bit of everything. But what the riders are definitely thinking about is that approach to this final climb and the Gorge Road. As I said two years ago, they came down Gorge Road to approach this climb. This year, they come up it. So it'll be about positioning the team's climber, getting them to the front of the bunch, saving as much energy as possible. When they climb up past the dam wall, that's a very steep section, and it's going to set the riders up for the turn onto Torrens Hill Road and up here to the finish line. And that's where it really kicks up very steep. It's at an average of 10% gradient for around a kilometre. So two years ago, Richie Port, he was the aggressor. He went on the attack. But then we saw somewhat of a, a indecisive group of leaders all looking at each other. They fanned across the road. Richie Port, well, he told me today, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to go hard all the way. Because as they fanned across on this climb two years ago, all started looking at each other, enabled Rowan Dennis to come back into contention and then spring somewhat of a surprise. He attacked up the left-hand side. He got the gap. Richie, Cadell, they just watched him ride away and he held on all the way to the finish. And what's really important about this stage is not just losing time and trying to be up near the front, but if you can win the stage, there's also a 10 second time bonus on the finish line. That helped Rowan Dinnis win this race two years ago. So a lot going on, tough climbs, there's a fast descent, there's a time bonuses, a very tactical stage coming up. And that last two kilometres, so pivotal, and you could see another little sneaky win from someone, because there are so many in the mix. There are so many, and we've got a stacked field this year. And I think it's going to be almost a battle between our, our best Australians like Richie Port and Simon Gerrans, etc., and a whole bunch of Colombians. But also don't underestimate the young Frenchman from Team Sky, Kenny Elisonde. He weighs about 50 kilo. He's a pure climber. And he's been training with Chris Froome. He's a late inclusion into this race. And he said, you know what? I think the Tour Down Under might be a little bit easier than training with Chris Froome. So I expect him to be up amongst it as well. All righty. We've got live pictures there. Great to hear the thoughts, the tactics from Robbie McEwen. And uh, let's get back to commentary in just a tick. It's a fantastic stage, isn't it? It's already been brilliant. And it's only going to get better from now. Stage two, Santos Tour Down Under.
62.6 kilometers no change at the front of this race at all we're on our final circuit now that's heathfield we've passed through no sprint there we've had those two sprints sutilin was the leader last time through paul high tempo but this man is holding off more than well he's increasing his lead just now yeah and i think they all realize though how important the final kilometers are going to be and uh, it was interesting to hear from richie port before the start this morning uh, saying that uh, he wasn't going to make the mistake that he made last year like the, but like two years ago when they came to this climb because he in fact was the guy who attacked and then everybody followed his first move and that allowed in fact to rowan dennis to come back and make the counter attack and they put the pressure on to uh, richie port to try and chase him down and it was that last minute attack and a couple of seconds advantage and the 10 second time bonus that gave rowan a Rowan Dennis the chance to get himself the victory and Richie Port seems to be just so much more concentrated this year on uh, being the aggressor and I think we'll see a very aggressive climb up to the finish line it's a longer climb as well it's a longer effort for these riders which could well suit the rider like Richie Port and Richie Port now on the same team as Rowan Dennis so there'll be no upset in the house if Richie does take on the race lead about the both be delighted Side 62 kilometers now. That man is giving it a real shot today. This isn't a gentle ride like yesterday with Lawrence de Vriesa, who broke away in slow motion and stayed away uh, until the last 20 kilometers of the stage, which was uh, curtailed by the hot weather. And in the end, the bunch spin pretty routine as it turned out, but it was a tough spin for Caleb Ewan to win. But he did it. So we've got uh, Hausen at the front, Luke Dervidge, Caleb Ewan on the Orica Scott team. And on the right, we've got the very colourful spectators who've ridden out of Adelaide today, probably fairly early on, and they've got a beautiful ride back on cycle paths, by the way, which are tucked into the hills. It is a lovely place, this. A little bit of help. Ian Stanner comes up just to check who's on the front. You can always tell Ian. He's seven feet taller than everybody else. A massive big man, a former British professional champion. He won a brilliant stage in the Tour of Britain last year. In fact, uh, he got away in a breakaway right from the very start. And the two riders uh, that were with him were unable to follow him going up the hills. And he just rode off on his own for the last 50 kilometres to get a, a great victory into uh, the ta into Tatton Park, just outside of Knutsford. Mm. He's a real puncher. He's a strong, strong rider. He's a big asset to the team. And he's won one-day Belgian classics as well for himself. This man's also been a winner in the past, 2011, I think it was, with the Tour of Berlin. I think that's a four-day race. This one's a six-day race, so he's a good stage race rider, but there's no hills in Berlin, to my knowledge. You can see how serious the Orica Scott are, though, Phil. Uh, every time it starts to slow down, just a little bit too much for them. Uh, they get themselves organised at the front. You've got to feel a little bit sorry for... Uh, Caleb Ewan, he's the leader of this bike race overall. He's already won a stage, and he obviously pretty much knows in the back of his mind that that ochre jersey is going to be ripped off his shoulders on this final climb of the day. And he's quite happy to come forward and assist in the pacemaking because he knows how important it is for his teams. Massive gap now. He's pushed it out to three kilometres now over the field. So he's enjoying his journey on this last lap. I really thought they would have started to close it in this circuit, but they've... It's going to become showdown on the final climb if they keep this up. Lotto and BMC. Teams with riders who could succeed if uh, everything works out right. They're up near the front. You see, over to the right-hand side, uh, you can see oh, the team see. of Trek Segafredo. I was just trying to figure out exactly what was going on there with the Lotto rider. I think he's bringing out uh, all the food sachets from inside his racing jersey. The band around his chest, by the way, is a heart monitor, and occasionally we're able to show you uh, those heartbeats on the screen. Oh, policeman's not quite there. Oh, he is now. They do an incredibly good job, and the police understand cycling, especially on the motorbikes. You've got to know where these guys are, which way the wind's blowing, which way they're going to switch on the road when they change wind directions and road directions police are magnificent here in South Australia they were actually the original escort went to the Tour de France uh, to see how it was done and all that was 19 years ago the result is they've got their own Tour de France now in South Australia left turn here as ever the road continues to go up Caleb Ewan he's more than a sprinter this young man rather like Peter Sagan now the super domestique in the race leader's jersey. 
Geraint Thomas, I saw there, leaping in as well. You get the feeling they're waiting for the moment right now to counter the move. long descent to a turn down the bottom if memory serves me right we're on the last circuit of five these circuits have gone rather quickly today it's been pretty tough just to hang in in the main field because uh, there's been a fairly steady tempo right from the very start I mean we're, we're looking at an average speed of uh, just inside of 37 kilometers an hour since the start so on a rippling circuit like this that's about 24 miles an hour the average speed so that's an indication that they've not been hanging around but uh, I can tell you one thing that once they start to battle for position heading up towards uh, the final climb of the day and the uh, charge into Torrens Hills Road that's when we'll see uh, speeds in excess of 50 kilometers an hour trying to set up their riders into a good position in this main field for the assault of the final climb of the day the man who uh, three years ago finished second or well, two and a half year really in the world time trial championship is on the front Damien Housen doing what he can do well get up into the high speed it was the tight team time trial by the way when he got that medal with his Orica team and in the old days well the year before when he was just coming into the business he was he was uh, the world under 23 individual time trial champion he's still uh, such a young guy he's just 24 years of age Team Sky now taking a serious uh, interest at the front of the peloton. Now that smallest rider just uh, at the back there for Team Sky is the rider who was pulled in at the very last minute when uh, Owen Dool uh, was reported to have that illness which turned out to be appendicitis and he was flown down from Queensland to be here and that's wow. because Team Sky really believe that Sergio Enao can win this race. Apparently his appendix ruptured. I think that caught, that makes it perizonitis, which is very, very dangerous indeed. But he seems to have made a full recovery. But he'll be out with cycling for a little while while it uh, all heals up. But it's best to get it at the start of the year, I suppose. Four minutes the gap. It's been locked in there on our screens. It's yo-yoing a little bit, a few seconds either way. 58.8 kilometers to ride. There's the peloton. They're really moving now. And it's all because of the impetus of Damien Housen. Watch out for the Cannondale boys on the right, on the left as we look, the lime green jersey, because Michael Woods is their secret weapon today, and Michael is not afraid, it seems, of this finishing climb. They've also got uh, Tom Yelterslachter, who knows this uh, circuit extremely well, because uh, as an unknown rider a couple of years ago, he got himself the victory when the race finished here in Stirling. Yes, he went on to win that race in 2013. He was a surprise, and we've got to be honest, he hasn't really excelled in victories ever since, but he's still a very solid professional. And all professionals have many jobs on a big team, like a World Tour team. Mount Lofty Ranges separates the city of Adelaide from the Adelaide Hills, where wine has been produced since the 1840s. Here you can eat the day away next to an historic water mill, or you can sit and toast among the vines. There's no shortage of ways to entertain yourself. There's something truly different though, you can even enjoy wines paired with exotic chocolates from around the world. It's been rated amongst the top 10 experiences of its kind in the world. Happy drinking, happy eating. These boys are getting on with work at the moment. They have been eating, though, uh, and wisely so, and drinking, but of course, just water, as they make their way towards the crossing of the gap. We're still on lap number five of five circuits of Stirling, and then we will break away, heading over to Paracol. They're about 14 kilometers away from uh, coming to the end of uh, the, the circuits, and that's when they'll break away and head down towards the very rapid descent down Norton Summit. But you can now start to see the teams assembling at the front of the main field. You've got Cannondale over on the left-hand side. Uh, I've also noticed uh, Lotto Jumbo and Elder, the Dutch squad, moving to the front, uh, looking after their man, uh, Wilco Kelderman. It'll be reversal now in from 3k's to 2.8 uh, so the tempo riding by Damien Housen here on the front is having a little bit of an effect on the breakaway but more importantly this is a high tempo speed the peloton all waiting 
to make the moves with their favourites. You can feel it even through the television screens today. This is the long, long descent, not to be recommended, sitting on the crossbar like that, but as you head down to these sharp corners, he knows very shortly, you go right here, then we head down to the left turn, which brings us on to the long climb for the last time up towards Sterling itself. Shake those legs loose. Here comes the left turn. It's about seven kilometers up this hill to the finishing line of old. But this time we will continue on and leave the circuit. I think we'll also see a different attitude in the main field now, Phil, as they start to wind up on this uh, final climb up here into Stirling, because they will also want to start the de de descent of Norton Summit at the front end of the main field, uh, just in case there's any mechanical problems, or just in case there are any accidents, they don't want to get caught behind a split, so the, the main peloton's uh, attitude, I think, will start to change very shortly. A bit more rehydration there, as the... This is the Powerade rehydration station, much lower down the climb. They would be, in the old days of racing to the top, they would have been concentrating now on winning the day. Well, we've just been joined now in the commentary box, hot foot from Sterling, where the race is still Robbie. Robbie McEwen, this is just the stage you would have hated, right? Precisely. I, I thought you were going to say this one you would have loved and uh, make fun of me again on a hilly stage. But yeah, this, this is a, a big, a tough ask for any sprinter. I mean, they're all going to get through it, but not going to get through it really at the front. But uh, Caleb Ewan, winner yesterday, he'll be putting himself at the service of his team. So it's a good opportunity, in fact, for the sprinters to do something in return for all the work that gets done for them. Yeah. It's uh, down to, let's say, the, the skinnier guys to be up there today. Well, you were at the start, Robbie atmosphere was nervous one perhaps it was race faces on all round you could the the anticipation there at the start and the it was palpable mm. it was like we were already lining up on saturday for the walunga stage guys know how critical this stage is going to be sometimes the stage is as hard as this almost puts them off racing hard early because they know how tough this final few kilometers is but it's not been easy around Sterling here as we start to see the teams uh, get themselves assembled at the front end of the main field. An average of about uh, 24 miles an hour, 37, 38 kilometres an hour. That's a tough average speed on a circuit like this and I think that will set it up for a, a real big showdown on this final climb. I think that's the, the exciting prospect of this stage. It doesn't matter if you ride fast or medium around this sterling circuit it's just the amount of climbing you've got to do before you get to the final part of the stage so whatever speed you're doing it's going to drain everyone's legs somewhat mm. and tip it in favor of the best climbers do you know much about this german chap in the lead Suterlin? i just found out something interesting uh, mm. via twitter someone drew my attention to it i got to got to be honest didn't find it myself but uh interesting yasha Suterlin on monday so the day before the tour proper he set the Strava record oh. on Torrens Hill Road. So the road Get up out. to the finish here. So he knows his way around. He's reconned it. Not only that, he's ridden up there the fastest of all 2,708 people who've had a crack at it. So they won't want wow. to well, give Well, Torrens Hill too Road, much. of course, is the official name for the Paracum climb where, where the race finishes. Well, that's interesting, Paul, isn't it? You see, that's why we, we bring Robbie into these things. He goes and finds that fact out. That's a good that's a good fact to know, but I'm not sure he's going to set the fastest time today, having ridden at the front of this race uh, for, uh, so far, a good uh, 100 kilometres or so. But what it does do is it toughens up the race for, for maybe one of his teammates, because if you look down the list of Movistar uh, riders there, not, not the real uh, heads of state from Movistar, but when you look at uh, Jesus Herrada, Victor de la Parte, they are good climbers, and, and what they would want is to have a tough race coming into that final climb, to be able to make the time differences. Yeah, the pure climbers need it to be hard. They need to be able to get rid of guys like Jay McCarthy, Simon Gerrans, the guys who can climb but are really punchy. Because don't forget, there's 10 second bonus on the finish line here. That could be GC all over if they don't offload those guys. But talking of Sutherland, what it also tells us, he might not set a new record today on that climb, but it tells us he's a good climber and he's not likely to crack, so they're going to have to ride fast to bring him back. So we're still showing four minutes there. It's come, I think, slightly inside that. The peloton swinging on to the long climb up towards Sterling for the last time. And then we start to cross towards the finish. They're going to have to do something soon.
Uh, this climb here, Rob, it, it's about seven kilometres up to the finishing line in, Sud in uh, Sterling. They climb it very fast, but it must be really difficult. Tempo wise, it, it is quite difficult when you start riding fast because it's a, an uneven climb. It's not a a gradual rise all the way. It it gets a little bit steeper, then flattens out. There's lots of corners as you're going through the the shadow of the trees. The the gradient of the road changes constantly, so it's, it can be quite stop start. And uh, that's another thing for that will bring some guys undone, I think. Well, we'll see at the moment, setting good tempo on the front at the moment in the red jersey, not to be confused with any of the multicolored red jersey teams. That is Danny Van Poffel setting the pace there. For Team Sky, he's pulled on the sprint leader's jersey, uh, which should at the moment be owned by uh, Kelly Buhn, but of course he's engaged in the race leader's jersey. There is a pecking order of jersey presentation. So Van Poppel rides at the front, and we've got Luke Derbidge just behind. And then comes Miles Scotson, celebrating his 23rd birthday today as champion of Australia in his very first professional bike race, which was uh, a couple of weeks ago now in uh, the national championships in Victoria in Ballarat. Oh, Phil, you just mentioned Danny Van Poppel there, second place getter behind Caleb Ewan yesterday in Lindock. Of course, son of the famous Jean-Paul Van Poppel, the great sprinter of the 80s. And I was quite flattered this morning. I was coming out of the hotel and I was in the lift with Danny Van Poppel. And we we're having a chat. I said, well done on your, your result yesterday. Good job. And he said, you know what? I had a photo with you when I was about eight. You came and rode one of the post-tour criteriums in Holland. And I was always a fan of the sprinters. And I got a photo then. Could I get another one now? And I think he just wants to put it next to the other and say, see how much bigger I am and stronger than Robbie now? <laughs> this little little kid. But it's, uh, yeah. it's always funny to come across guys. You've seen them as a kid. They've been inspired by the professionals and then turn pro themselves and, and are winning races at, at world tour level. But you uh, must have nice raced against Jean-Paul, didn't you? Did you beat him? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, or was it just? Same, same generation. Yeah, just, just the way. Just a bit after, yeah. 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 Probably a good thing. I think it was. I'd like to know which was the faster, though, because uh, Jean-Paul was a pretty good bike rider, wasn't it? Very impressive I enjoyed calling him in the sprints. He's much bigger than you, though, Rob. Easy to find. Oh, easy to find. I could, I could spot him straight away. Could well, never find you. It is interesting how many uh, of uh, the riders coming through have uh, been inspired by being able to stand next to a great champion. Talking to uh, Anna Mears, uh, she was uh, really thrilled to have met uh, Michelle Ferris when she was uh, a young rider and, and managed to emulate her on the track, and, and she's doing the same thing now. And you know it makes it even more impressive for a guy like Danny Van Poppel being as good as he is, and his brother, Boy, who rides for United Healthcare, having a famous father, very difficult to deal with. Think of a guy like Axel Merckx, how do you follow that? So, added pressure, but they're doing a great job, so good on them. Well, we're watching here the leader on the road and has been the leader on the road since the 24th kilometre today, uh, Yasha Sutlin. And he's not looking like a man who's getting tired just now as he heads up to Sterling for the last time before breaking clear. Great to have your company, Channel 9's Wide World of Sports, and it really is a festival of cycling here at the Santos Tour Down Under. The racing is wonderful, we've got a great stage, and we're just about to launch into a fantastic finish, but there's all sorts of opportunities for people of all ages to get involved and be a part of what is a magical week. We could get close to one million fans this week, which would just be extraordinary. The man who looks after our fan cam, he gets amongst all the people, is former Olympic medalist former Commonwealth Games gold medalist John Stephenson. He loves it, Johnny, and this fan cam today has a very special touch. So I'm here with the voice of cycling, Mr. Phil Liggett. Watch for the champion's jersey. What a terrific finish this is. And now they're coming after him. Phil, we just finished our ride, magnificent ride down to Glen Elk. Explain the story behind the group of guys that we went out with today. It all started back in 99. They rang me up and they said, did I ride a bike? And I said, yeah. They said, would I ride with them? And I says, yes. What time? They said, 5.30 in the morning. I said, no. I said, 6.15, we're on. And so, and, and you meet at my hotel, and it's grown and grown. All, all the guys are personal friends now, 20 years on, you know, all mates. It's quite amazing.
amazing. Um, this is what cycling brings, and I think that's what the Tour de Under brings, that, that community feel. And for people to come riding with a legend like yourself and then get to watch you and hear you commentate throughout the day, you can really see there's a real family element to this. We form the club. I mean, everyone's in the same jersey now, as you can see, and uh, we made friends with Bocelli, who's Italian, so you must have a, an Italian coffee shop sponsor you, and they look after us, we come here a lot, and this is our base now, and it happens like this every year. It's like we've never been away for 51 weeks, we're back. Well, for those that don't know, my man Phil's been a little bit under the weather the last couple yeah, of days, but never like misses a ride. No, it's pretty cool, I mean, <laughs> and it was hard today. I thought you were going pretty well for an old man. Keep going. I was very impressed, but there's not much of you. I needed more protection from the wind. The weather was beautiful, good friends, great place to cycle down in yeah. Glenelg. That's what Adelaide provides. But you know, when I was a racing cyclist, of course, I never dreamt I'd ever be passed by a girl. And, uh, yeah. It's happened many times since. <laughs> but, today, but we don't mind. Those two girls are caught us on the Anzac Highway and didn't even wait for us. I thought, now this is getting a bit ridiculous. But Chivalry's not dead with us. We allowed them to take the lead. That's a good point. That's a good point. This is what I've always liked this man. No Superman. The man is Phil Liggett. Thanks, mate. Oh, a bit of a bromance growing there between Phil and John. Fan cam today. Now get to the website, the Santos Tour Down Under website, and go to Tour Tracker because it has all the information that you need. It's got all the riders, it's got the teams, it's got the countries they're from, and uh, all the other tidbits of information. Now, if you want to ask Robbie McEwen, a bloke that was just an extraordinary cyclist, any question you like, ask Robbie. TDU. That's the hashtag on Twitter, and we will endeavour to answer as many possible questions as we can for the great Robbie McEwen. Well, not a long way to go in this big race, stage two of the Santos Tour Down Under. How's it going to finish? Well, as we look down through the trees, uh, it's not long now before he will leave the circuit. And uh, for me, he's looking really good. Well, he's really managed his effort uh, throughout the whole of this course. I'm, I'm not still convinced that uh, he was uh, thinking he was going to win the stage there because it's such a decisive stage. And there are so many teams now starting to wind themselves up towards the front end of the main field because you've got two battles are going to happen, I think, over the next few kilometres. The battle to position themselves for the descent because you don't want to start the descent of Norton Summit in the last half of the main field. And then, of course, the battle for position to start the final climb. So that's going to really drag up the average speed in the main field and we'll see that gap I think start to tumble and uh, from uh, 3.55 at the moment I would uh, expect it to drop down to two minutes quite rapidly. The descent Rob down Norton Summit it is a it's an okay descent but it, it, it's so near the finish they're going to take risks. They are going to take risks I mean they've got to start the chase they've got to wind Sutilin back in and there's going to be a fight somewhat of a fight for position already going down Norton Summit. You don't want to be behind a split, so you've got to be at the front, take the risks. All right, well, let's bring you right up to date. Story so far, this is stage two between Stirling and Paracombe. We are about to complete our five circuits of Stirling. That's where the race started from. When we come to this finishing line, which we're seeing starting line, in a few moments' time, we'll be turning away from this course. But they started out, and the first attack coming from a former winner back in 2011, the rider from Perth, Cameron Meyer, and he was joined there by Andre Sink, riding his first big World Tour event. They wound him in uh, just about. They had to because there was a big sprint around the corner at Heathfield, and they were after the time bonuses. And this is quite an interesting sprint, Paul. It was. It looked as if it was going to go all the way of Orica Scott, but getting mixed in there, the world champion of Peter Sagan. But when they uh, really accelerated to the line, the rider on the left-hand side for UAE, Ben Swift, was just ahead of Jay McCarthy. And Caleb Ewan, the big sprinter, he wasn't even in the prizes. No, I think he crossed the line probably in fourth. Then the breakaway started straight after that sprint off the up the road went Yashe Sutelin, the German cyclist on the Spanish Movistar team. Uh, the day's leader in the Caleb Ewing having a joke there with the world champion Peter Sagan. At least the pressure is off for the moment. Time gap rapidly climbed to four and a half minutes as the laps continued around Sterling. We went through the uh, rehydration station and then came the next sprint at the same sprint point a different lap and again another good sprint but for second place this time yes so the two riders who went across there uh, michael kohler and rudiger selig both from bora bora hansgrove 
and really not affecting the situation on the road. Those small time bonuses uh, utilized in fact. That's the race so far. He's still clear, of course, for how long we'll find out soon as we're about to change direction. 46 kilometers left to go. Continuing the slog up the hill. This is the last time for everybody in Sterling who've always loved this race. Listen to them cheering through. And then there'll be a mass exodus inside to their houses to watch TV. So, the lone leader, Yasha Sutalin, has got about 3 minutes 50. We'll check as he goes to the finishing line. Now, making his way up to the top of this long climb in Sterling for the last time. It's now turn right and head towards the finish. And that's the peloton on the same climb, but uh, about two kilometers further down the climb than Yasha Sutalin. It's always uh, just about this point in the race, so when you look uh, 45 kilometres to go, about uh, 27 miles of racing, the gap's hovering at four minutes, you start to think, well, this guy's got quite a chance uh, to survive on a day like this, but you always forget how fast the main field can go once they start to get themselves wind up on the approach to the final climb of the day. That's right, Paul, it's, it's going to start already. Well, from now, you've got more teams taking part. Scotson's at the front of the peloton helping drive that pace on behalf of Team BMC. But it keeps going uphill out of Stirling. For a few more kilometres yet, they're going to climb. They've already done more than 2,000 metres of vertical gain as they leave the circuit of Stirling. But it, like you said, that flat section on the run through the outskirts of Adelaide and especially the early part of the Gorge Road, they will just eat into that time gap so fast that Sutherland will won't really know what hit him. So we see Danny Van Poppel dropping back through the bunch, but I imagine that's not getting dropped, but probably more going back to get some water bottles and it replenish looks the he's team. He's working pretty hard to me, Rob. Working pretty hard, but I think he'll take <laughs> advantage and make it look like I'm just going back to get some bottles, and it might be a nice relief just to get those hand-off bottles and uh, sling him back up a bit. Wow, well, that's not where he, he doesn't want to be. He come through there very rapidly. Anyway... He's a sprinter, of course, and he's still got 45 kilometres to complete on the course. As we go to the leader, Sutalin, I haven't seen him change direction, but I'm not sure. He may well have done by now. Still got to go uh, through the, uh, the edge of Sterling before he uh, takes up, up that right-hand turn, and then he starts to line himself up for the big descent. So the main oh. field, though, in the heart of Sterling. Then he has taken a turn, the right, made the right turn off the course. Now, don't you be noticed, got a big bicycle tattoo on the inside of his forearm there as well. On his left arm. Well, they must be thinking it's now or never because it's not very far. The roads are very challenging all of the way today. It's a very ambitious route, this, I have to say, by the organisation. And I think it could result in a, a very, very good showdown. Big risk by the organisation to, to, to do that, to make the first part of this race as tough with five circuits here around Stirling. Because, as you said a little earlier on uh, this morning, sometimes when the, the race is too hard, the riders don't race uh, quite as dramatically. But they, they've rip, rip round here quite hard. Yeah, they've gone around quite fast. And I think whether they race full gas or just ride around it at tempo speed it's still going to affect the legs so i think it's been a good decision to to do this for the race and put in another pivotal stage which could have more influence than the walunga stage itself which we always talk about team sky are taking a bit of an interest now too we we saw van poppel slide down to the back of the peloton but the teammates and ian standard are all at the front here now so they might be making an impression well, we've talked an awful lot about uh, Orica Scott and Team BMC Racing, but uh, I tell you what, when you read down the roster of Team Sky, it's a pretty impressive roster too. Uh, Geraint Thomas, Sebastian Arnau, Sergio Arnau, and of course Kenny Ellison, who's a great climber in his own right.
great to have you company. Channel 9's Wild World of Sports. We are looking at pictures from the women's tour down under. And hasn't it been great? Finished last night with the criterium. But uh, some wonderful racing. 17 teams, over 100 competitors. And crowds were great. The whole of the race was absolutely superb. And the man that was there calling it, of course, the whole way along was former Olympic gold medalist. You remember the Madison at the City Olympic Games, Scott McGrory. Uh, it was a great race. Oh, it certainly was, Tim. And it's just fantastic to see how the race has evolved so quickly. It's only the third edition of it, and it's already up to uh, the highest, well, one of the higher UCI categories, so it's a fantastic place to where it's at now, and it really is a, a great beneficial um, a, a tour for the, the local riders as well to mix themselves up against some of the best internationals. And the final stage, stage four, was at Victoria Park, right in the centre of Adelaide. Spot, isn't it? Certainly, and then Stuart O'Grady has his cafe right yeah, there, yeah. so we were uh, going in there as well. There was an intermediate sprint throughout the uh, one-hour race that they had, and all each of these sprints had time bonuses, three, two, and one seconds on them. And uh, Lauren Kitchen, New South Wales last, she was really chasing those to try and move up in the overall classification. She put herself into fourth place, got up to third, but then everything, everyone was looking in towards Kirsten Vild from uh, the big Dutch rider from the American um, Silence team, and they just did an incredible job yet again to lead her out for the final stage victory. She got the time bonuses as well for that, so that made sure she did finish third overall. Powerful sprint by Kirsten Vild. Annette Edmondson from Adelaide was second. Chloe Hosking just got pipped by Nettie for third. So two Australians right in the mix. So Kirsten Vild, fantastic sprint for her. Second stage win out of four for her, the two Criterium stages. But of course, Amanda Spratt was the overall winner from Orica Scott. Just a powerful performance on day one, the first stage, where she rode away from everyone on the final climb and then soloed to victory. And she held on to that 19-second lead all the way to the finish. Yeah, and is a proud owner of the blue jersey from the uh, 2017 Santos Tour Down Under for Women. Just gets better and better. Now, Scott, here we are. They've uh, said, look, to a man, really, that this is the toughest stage we've seen at the Santos Tour Down Under. Sterling, we're, we're coming out of Sterling, and then it's up Paracombe to where we are here. It's a it's a real gruelling race. Look, it really is, and everyone's talking about it. And, of course, the heat from yesterday. So they're all feeling, you know, while the race was shortened yesterday because of those extreme temperatures, it would have cost the riders something. They would have really used so much more energy than they normally would have. So they'd come in today, even though the temperatures came down today, they still would be somewhat more exhausted than they would normally would be after that first stage in the the heat and remember the last time he came to Paracone when Rowan Dennis won they came from the top of the gorge and it was really only just a 2k climb up to Paracone this time they're coming from the bottom of Gorge Road so that makes the full length of the climb closer to seven kilometers in length it's brutal it's the hardest stage I've ever seen at the Santos Tour down under and the fact that I'm a retired cyclist now from professional ranks I love it because I can just watch it and see them suffer oh yeah it's going to be great to watch the fish look always good to catch up with you Scott wonderful calling when the women's tour and we love watching that just get better and better. We'll talk to you very soon. We're going to get back to uh, live commentary with the boys uh, right now because this race has 42.5 k's to go. Suter in. 42 kilometres to go. Robbie, does he have any chance of success? I, I mean, think he does have a chance. Okay. I think he does have a chance. The peloton will really eat into that lead on the once he gets off Norton Summit onto the flatter roads and especially up the gorge where they you know they'll use their power in numbers and a lot of riders really emptying the tank in service of their team leader. But he does have a chance that once he can get to the descent of Norton Summit, he gets quite a good rest and then he can concentrate on literally riding a time trial as hard as he can from there all the way to the finish. And looking that Team Sky have now put riders in the front with the likes of Ian Stannard driving the pace and Van Poppel, his teammate, finding it tough and drifting out the back. Sutherland has not given up a single second. He's still at 3 minutes 55. Although, now we've got a new check. So I was very surprised to see 3.55 on the screen. Ah, If yes. this is right, this would be more what you would expect because yeah. the pace really did increase. Yeah. So that that is more normal. I'm... Uh, well, relax think, now. Yeah, well, I think we have to understand how quickly those guys actually went up that climb uh, and they came into Stirling the last time. And he would have lost a, a good one to one and a half minutes on that uh, long ascent into Stirling. He was banking maybe on uh, keeping a good chunk of his advantage for the descent down Norton Summit because he shouldn't lose any time there at all. But looking at the difference in the main field now, look how long that line is. That's the most savage the peloton has been since the start this morning. And now getting official confirmation of that time gap at 1.55, then uh, no chance yeah. he will be caught. Well, that was a waste of five minutes' conversation, <laughs> yeah, well, boys. Yeah, they've got yeah. us through a bit anyway. We're a bit closer to the finish now, Phil. But And Sky clearly are looking for Sergio A now now to put in, in him 
in a position because he's the climber on the team. Yeah, it was third overall last year. He's not at all scared of going uphill. And it may well be uh, today a battle of the Colombians. We've talked also uh, a lot about Esteban Chavez. But a name I'd like to just throw into the pot is uh, Jarlinson Pantano, who ah. rides for Trek Segafredo. Had a great breakthrough season last year with a brilliant ride in the Tour of Switzerland and, of course, a stage victory in the Tour de France. And you've seen Trek Segafredo, I think, this year. They've, they've gone up a notch. They're, they're much more attentive in this race. They were over the first day looking to lort out their, uh, their sprinter, Edward Toons, but here they're working as a really good squad. Well, we've got Team Sky working on the front now, and here's a little bit of an interesting uh, soundbite for you because uh, Adam Hansen is not on the Team Sky team, but here he is talking about the tactics and the integral part of them playing in the race. And he used Team Sky as an example, so just listen to this. Sometimes when you come to climb, you see guys attacking. Sometimes it's better to stay in your zone. You see Sky, they did it all the time in the Tour de France. They just ride tempo, and that's what they're doing. They're looking at computers, staying in the zone. And when guys, and it can be, um, it can destroy what the race looks like because what Sky does, for example, they ride at their threshold, and they know when guys attack, they cannot manage it. You know, if they, let's say for an example, it's five kilometer climb, and guys attack four kilometers out, and they're riding on their threshold above the threshold and the, and to break away you've got to go 10 15 percent harder they know that you cannot hold that pace to the finish so they just hold the tempo and they know that they'll come back well i tell you what you've got to respect adam hansen rob because that guy's done it all he has i mean he's done all of the grand tours for the last five years he's done 16 in a row so he has seen quite a bit going on and he's dead right what he says about Team Sky they, they ride at that tempo they know they can maintain and they know that other riders are not physically capable of maintaining that extra effort to break away and they just reel them back in as if they had them on the hook and just wind them on back and now Sutherland we saw him a second ago look over his shoulder <laughs> well that's why look at that because for the, the last time chip we got was the one minute margin oh. well it's uh, about one inch right now I think our motorbikes might be having trouble keeping up because that's, of course, where we get our timing from the GPS unit on the motorbikes. But Sutherland, he knows the jig is up. Yeah, well, from four minutes well, I think he's a bit to nothing too. in around about five kilometres. Well, he's a bit shocked. Well, he broke away at 24 kilometres into a 148 kilometre stage. He's been caught just 40 kilometres from the finish. Crossing a little bit of the open plains here now as we turn our back on Sterling and race across open countryside, heading towards Norton Summit. Well, we see now they made that catch of Sutherland, but it's not as if they said, OK, we've caught him now, we're going to sit up a little bit and take it easy, because now begins that fight for position for the team leaders to get on the top of the descent of Norton Summit at the front of the peloton, stay out of danger, be in control of the race. Don't get surprised by a split in the bunch or a possible crash. You don't want to be too far back and wasting energy. And you see the team starting to be more cohesive, Team Sky all together there at the front, minus Van Poppel. Three hours in the saddle, and the most of it done off the front there by Sutelin, but he's now back in the pack. Now you see there's a group of riders off the back of that peloton now. The previous attack by Team Sky has hurt a number of... Y expectativas es lo que despierta Sergio Luis por esta temporada, lo señalaba antes de que iniciara muchas competencias de este calendario UCI World Tour, las esperaba y las espera hacer de muy buena forma, de momento este Tour Down Under donde llega como uno de los corredores favoritos a disputar el título, pues eh, le genera gran expectativa, lastimosamente hoy con esta, este percance, pero seguramente podrá recuperarse, esperemos que sí, aunque no vemos mayor colaboración de quienes lo acompañan, simplemente depende de su equipo. Bueno, hay dos corredores del equipo Cannondale, ahí está Tomás Esculi y Don Vanasbrook. No, perdón, Patrick Bevan. Patrick Bevan son los dos corredores del equipo Cannondale. Pero vean cómo se ha puesto a trabajar Kenny Lison. Se le pone por delante a Sergio. Sergio lo veo tranquilo a pesar de que está haciendo un desgaste que no era necesario en este momento. Creo que tiene más motor que el mismo Kenny Lison y está tratando como de decirle o te rebaso o me sigues o le aprietas porque yo tengo, tengo que llegar. Total, en la rencora anterior demostró que de los que están en la, en la zona de rezagados es el que está más completo y más entero. Lo demostró porque 
no se fue solo porque no le conviene, pero tenía muchísimo gas por delante que los demás. Y Ellison le puede dar una buena mano ahora que se ponga la carretera cuesta arriba y lo va a necesitar Sergio Luis porque con la muestra que nos dio aquí de poderío, seguro que es candidato a la etapa si logra llegar dentro del grupo importante. Recuerden ustedes que mientras puedan ir rebasando autos, los comisarios no le van a, a poner ningún tipo de sanción porque están haciendo el avance. Mientras sigan avanzando entre los autos, no hay sanción por cobijarse en algún momento detrás de los vehículos. Pero está haciendo lo, in, lo, lo imposible que Nilsson ahora por volverse a poner por delante... Está tratando de hacer el conteo de los cuantos coches nos quedan por delante para tratar de llegar a la cola del pelotón porque se le ha ido de las manos en este momento su posibilidad y lo que le quede en las piernas lo va a tener que explotar en algún momento. Pero regresamos adelante en donde la colaboración de otros equipos está haciendo la carrera más difícil para el antioqueño, está trabajando el Lorica Scott. Y también estamos viendo la presencia del equipo Bora, que se está poniendo por delante. En algún momento empezaremos a ver la figura también de Peter Sagan por ahí asomarse. Pero le están dejando a este equipo del Orica Scott, de alguna manera, la gran responsabilidad de hacer el, el, el ritmo y dejar atrás a los enemigos más duros. Y es normal ver la reacción de Kenny Ellison, quien hace lo posible, no estaba planillado para esta competencia, llega acá y le toca pues, hacer lo posible por eh, trabajar para Sergio Luis Henao, que sin duda es la carta para hoy del equipo Sky a pesar de las circunstancias. Y a través de nuestra etiqueta el numeral El Mundo Rueda por Señal, los colombianos siguen apoyando a los ciclistas que nos representan, es el caso de Sergio Luis Henao, que siguen eh, manifestando, es uno de los corredores favoritos, María Elvira Ruiz le da su voto al corredor colombiano, también de Wilson Orlando López nos saluda desde Cuicán, Boyacá, Dice que trasnochando con el ciclismo a través de Señal Colombia, Colombia Wilton también, también se reporta, lo hace Julián eh, Vargas a través eh, de Numeral El Mundo Rueda por Señal, desde Tauramena, Casanare, nos saludan y ustedes pueden escribirnos si consideran que es posible que Sergio Luis Senao llegue al grupo y pueda eh, hacer eh, realidad su propósito para esta etapa y también que colombianos consideran que se pueden destacar en esta jornada número 2 del Tour Down Under. La otra fila de azules con la M del pecho es el equipo Movistar que va a poner también la perspectiva para Jesús Herrada que es el mejor escalador con el que llegan acá, aunque tampoco habría que descontar la presencia de Marc Soler, un hombre que se destacó muchísimo en el Tour del Avenir, el Tour del Avenir que usted va a poder ver a través de Señal Deportes. Un evento que se celebra en el mes de agosto y que significa el Tour de France para los jóvenes. Y usted lo podrá ver a través de esta pantalla por primera vez en la historia de la televisión de Colombia. Se va a poder ver el Tour de la Avenida en directo a través de esta pantalla. Ya se acercaron, como habíamos dicho, los del equipo de Abu Dhabi, de los Emiratos Árabes Unidos, para la causa de Diego Ulisi. Tres horas y media de competencia. Y estamos empezando ya el descuento de los últimos 10 kilómetros. No nos han especificado, pero ya estamos en tren. Yo creo que ya estamos en los últimos ocho porque ya se puso dura la carretera. Y aparecen las curvas pronunciadas, las curvas que requieren de sangre fría de parte de los corredores y el ascenso. Esperando también que suceda con el tráfico porque lucha hoy con el tráfico Sergio Luis Senado. Y ya comienza a exhibirse en la parte posterior del pelotón el catucha de Jonathan Restrepo que también hace parte de las posibilidades de disputar este final de etapa. Se muestran allí junto a Lorica que ya también se hace presente en la punta del pelotón. En ese grupo de los Emiratos Árabes Unidos, Abu Dhabi, se encuentra Luis Mentíez también el sudafricano con el dorsal número 165 apoyando la causa... Diego Ulisi también en esa fila, pero me sorprende la cantidad de corredores del equipo Catucha. Entre ellos está José Goncalves, Ángel Vicioso, Tiago Machado y el mismo Jonathan Restrepo. Ahí lo tienen ustedes con el número 117. Ese es Jonathan Restrepo, Pácora, que estará hoy con esa posibilidad que ya se le fue de las manos a Sebastián Henao por ayudar a su primo en la persecución para la clasificación del Sub-23. Muy importante también esa posibilidad que tiene el eh, equipo de licencia rusa. Nueve kilómetros entonces, nueve kilómetros para llegar a la cima de este premio de montaña de primera categoría 
con el remate más difícil en los últimos 1.600 metros del casi 9% de, de gradiente en la subida. Y comienzan a mirarse de reojo, comienza a aparecer una tensión en el ambiente, esperando a ver quién es el primero que lanza ataque, cuál es el primero que decide probar las piernas de los contrincantes, por ahora están rodando a una velocidad importante, entendiendo que este es un terreno de ascenso, bien por Restrepo, Esteban Chávez también está bien ubicado, es uno de estos corredores, Esteban, que sabemos que ataca sorpresivamente, gusta de los ataques sorpresivos, si sí, finalmente se decide su equipo por arriesgar con Esteban, o si esperan que sea Simón Guerrán, el hombre que busque la buena ubicación. También hay uniformes del equipo Trek Segafredo, vamos a ver si se acerca un poco más la cámara para... Identificar si por ahí se encuentra el número 175 de Harlinson Pantano. También hay bastante presencia de Loto Soudal. ¿eh? Ese es otro equipo que eh, tiene cartas. Y también está el Sunweb que estaría peleando con Vilco Kelderman en la llegada. Aunque tampoco eh, podemos ver también a Simon Geschke que le va muy bien este tipo de subidas también al hombre barbado. Se está quedando cortado por ahora Tomás de Gent. Pensé que iba a estar más activo adelante, pero no. No nos han vuelto a mostrar dónde está Sergio Luis Henao, pero el que sí está aquí es Guerrán Tomás con el número 41 del equipo Sky. Y bueno, para esa formación, el que esté Guerrán Tomás por lo menos le saca un suspiro de alivio y que no se pierda por completo la posibilidad de la general en esta segunda etapa. Guerrán Tomás al lado de Esteban Chávez, ahí los veíamos marchando a la velocidad que rueda el pelotón ya en lo que son los últimos 10 kilómetros de la etapa a la expectativa, quién ataca primero, quién juega sus cartas todo está por verse en estos kilómetros finales del equipo del AG2R está un hombre que ayer también tuvo su oportunidad a la salida, Jan Bakelens Estoy viendo si, si se coló por ahí Doménico por su vivo, que también es muy buen escalador. Y creo que está Ben Gestauer, creo que también está ahí entre los tres representantes del AG2R. Por parte del equipo del Canon de Thomas Scully, este muchacho que está aquí también de, de reemplazo, porque él tampoco se supone que iba a venir aquí a trabajar, pero aquí lo tienen presente. Ya se abre, ya entregó lo que tenía en las piernas. El AG2R está ahí, a la vista, pero nosotros le ponemos los ojos al número 2, ahí lo tienen en medio de la pantalla, Esteban Chávez, que viene a las espaldas de Guerrán Tomás, y ahí está ya eh, el uniforme del líder, qué importante es la colaboración de, de un hombre tan pequeño, tan veloz, y todavía está ahí. Sí, ahí está la cuarteta en punta de la orica que es Caleb Ewan, seguido por Dari Limpe, luego aparece... Simón Guerranz y en cuarta ubicación está Esteban Chávez, esperando el momento, esperando la orden de quién ataca primero. Esa es la gran incógnita en cuanto a la estrategia de Lorica. Si finalmente será Guerranz o le dan chance al Colombia. Y es el trabajo que se evidencia en los equipos. Ayer todos trabajaban para Caleb Iwan, hoy es él el que se pone al frente porque sabe que las intenciones son diferentes. Está tirando sus restos para cuando llegue la cuesta, pues dejarle todo servido a sus compañeros y que puedan hacer bien su trabajo y lo que han planeado para hoy. Bueno, hoy no creemos que hayan tenido que hacer un cambio de piñonería especial. Es una, una subida pues que... Digamos, se puede, se puede llevar a ritmo y eh, seguramente traen la piñonería normal del 59-39 y atrás un 11-28, eso es lo que pensamos, traigan más o menos en, en promedio todos. Ahí veíamos eh, cómo empezaba a perder también el ritmo Edward Thames, que es otro de los sprinters del equipo Trek, que se está empezando a quedar cortado. Pero muchos embaladores han durado bastante, bastante a pesar del ritmo. Esa es la naturaleza del remate, porque tenemos los 400 metros posteriores al premio de montaña. El que logre colarse ahí va a tener muy buena oportunidad, pero hay que resistir el ritmo. Y aquí estuvo Caleb, hizo su trabajo a algo más de 6 kilómetros de distancia de la meta. Se entrega el líder y tiene que continuar poniendo el ritmo ahora otro equipo. No va a ser el Orica, es el AG2R el que ahora toma el ritmo del pelotón. Se empieza a enseñar los colores del equipo Loto Jumbo. Robert Gessing, venga, se le, se le bajó el switch. Se le apagó completamente la energía. Aplauso enorme para The Pocket Rocket, quien ya eh, ha entregado su labor adelante. Ya, bueno, también el eh, Dimension Data que había venido un poco ahí como escondido. Están empezando ellos con Lachlan Morton. 
Ahí lo tiene, es uno de los dos que está aquí adelante. Y Peter Sagan está ubicado en el grupo, pero no se está preocupando demasiado ni de gastar, ni de colocarse, ni nada. Bueno, estamos esperando que nos muestren dónde está Sergio Luis Enao, porque... Bueno, está, está pendiente la familia, ¿eh? Gracias, Mile, y a todos allá en casa. Un abrazo muy grande a toda la familia de Nao. Eh, pues confiando en que, en que Sergio eh, mantenga el corazón y las piernas hasta el final. Pues todos se reportan a través de la etiqueta numeral El Mundo Rueda por Señal. Y siguen llegando los saludos de quienes están pendientes eh, de esta transmisión, apoyando a los colombianos, apoyando también a los ciclistas más importantes que inician temporada en territorio australiano y están eh, eh, prestos a definir esta segunda etapa en uno de los territorios más emotivos como la montaña. Recuerden que a través de esta etiqueta, numeral El Mundo Rueda por Señal, ustedes pueden seguirnos escribiendo y contándonos desde dónde siguen la competencia. Nos confirma la cuenta oficial del equipo Sky que Sergio ha regresado. Sergio ha regresado, pero seguramente la pila le habrá ya pasado factura el esfuerzo. Sin embargo, sabemos que el hombre tiene ese corazón tan grande que lo va a mantener seguramente con la perspectiva. Y cuando vienes con la adrenalina también de un susto, a veces las cosas salen mejor. Y tiene que guardar estos próximos dos kilómetros esperando la recuperación. Para ser explosivo al final, lo tienen que guardar y lo está haciendo bien, logró reconectar, le favoreció el tráfico, el tráfico no siempre es malo, Goga, esta vez el tráfico fue bueno y alcanzó a reconectar Sergio Luis Henao, gracias también al apoyo de Sebastián y de Kenny Ellison. ¿eh? Kenny Ellison eh, pasó de rodar cinco horas con, con Christopher Brown a rodar tres horas y media en carrera con Sergio Luis Henao. Y decíamos del equipo Loto Jumbo porque ahí está Robert Gessing y Enrico Bataglin. Así que los, los vamos a seguir estos uniformes. Paul Martin también lo, lo vemos ahí con el número 153. Vamos a empezar a ubicar a los colombianos en este grupo de trabajo. Ustedes les pasamos el número para que los busquen también con el número 175. Carlinson Pantano, aquí hay un ataque del equipo Catucho. Es el, el equipo Catucho el que se está tratando de lanzar en este ah, no, momento no, 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 al ataque. Parte de este equipo está haciendo un entrenamiento arduo en España también. Y ahí lo tienen ustedes. El primer ataque viene en la subida por parte del equipo Catucho. Aunque claro, el esfuerzo creo que no le está dando muchos réditos porque el equipo de eh, eh, Árabes Unidos, Abu Dhabi, hace la persecución del otro lado de la carretera. Vemos los uniformes del equipo Orica Scott en donde se encuentra la figura de Esteban Chávez. Aquí está José Goncalves que ya ha sido recuperado. Se acabó el susto, no duró casi nada, pero... Esos son los pequeños chispazos que también aminoran las piernas de los rivales. Y veíamos la propuesta, por lo menos del equipo Catucha, que al ver eh, que todo está pues, a, a fuerte ritmo, pero todavía no se presentan propuestas, pues ha salido por lo menos a mover eh, el grupo, a que todos estén más pendientes y buscando, por qué no, eh, debilitar un poco a sus rivales. Bueno, ahí está ya. Ahí lo tienen ustedes, Sergio Luis Henao está ahí, viene cruzando a su lado Peter Sagan, pero Sergio Luis está ahí. Entramos en el umbral de los últimos tres kilómetros, pero como es llegada en alto, si hay una caída, un pinchazo mecánico, aquí no hay protección. Es una llegada en alto y el reglamento es muy claro en ese sentido, las llegadas en alto no tienen esa particularidad como la tienen las llegadas en llano. Así que ya tenemos a Sergio Luis Henao con Esteban Chávez en este grupo. Peter Sagan del lado izquierdo de sus pantallas empieza a asomarse en la enorme humanidad de este doble campeón del mundo. Pero también está Vico Kelderman, el, el equipo Sunweb. Recuerde que los últimos 1.600 metros son los más difíciles y después van a existir un par de curvas suaves para llegar finalmente a la meta en la cima de este premio de montaña de primera categoría. Ojos atentos, oídos despiertos, porque viene el otro momento crítico, el punto de quiebre de la etapa, y será como afronte ese remate empinado. 
atención porque allí es donde dos equipos, el trabajo que han hecho durante los kilómetros anteriores, se lo ponen en riesgo. Por eso Lorica aló hasta faltando dos kilómetros para este punto y disminuyó. Le costó a Caleb en su posición, eh, muy probablemente pierde el liderato al final de la etapa, pero hizo el trabajo estratégico. Midieron las piernas de los demás, ahora han vuelto a reservar y puede aparecer el contraataque. Se está moviendo Peter Sagan, Jay McCarthy se le pone a la rueda Peter Sagan. Esa es la carta de la clasificación general que tiene este equipo nuevo, el equipo de Peter Sagan. Y ahora sí, ahora sí se van a empezar. Miren nada más a Peter Sagan poniéndose a trabajar a la causa de Jay McCarthy. Empiezan a desprenderse algunas ruedas. Les está costando mucho trabajo mantener ese ritmo. A ver cómo le va a Jay McCarthy y va a salir ahí escondido Richie Port. A sus espaldas tiene, ya viene Jesús Cerrada. Jesús Cerrada también se pone a trabajar. Vico Kelderman se está acercando. También se acerca Esteban Chávez entre los primeros cinco. Pero Richie Port es el primero de los favoritos en moverse para rematar en los últimos 1.600 metros. Esto se puso bueno, ataques y contraataques, comienzan a probar las piernas del rival y de aquí en adelante todo será cambios de ritmo, cambios de ritmo para romper el pedaleo de los contrarios. Y qué bien se ve a Esteban Chávez con ese pedaleo tranquilo al que nos tiene acostumbrados y quién toma la iniciativa, quién más, sino el que tiene la espinita con el Tour de Brandia. Estarán alargando la punta del pelotón. Ahí está, es el Domenico Pozo Vivo, el de la G2R que se está acercando. Pero Richie Ford no se puede sacudir al hombre del equipo Movistar. Se están acercando otros corredores, ya se empieza a hacer una brecha. Richie Ford quiere atacar temprano, no quiere que otros corredores le vayan a explotar. El cohete antes de tiempo y, mané, y qué manera de castigar al ritmo. Último kilómetro, estamos en el último kilómetro. Pero la meta no está en cruzar el premio de montaña. Todavía hay que remar por 400 metros más. Richie Ford está haciéndolo todo, solo. No quiere sorpresas y esto también hay que aplaudírselo porque no es tan fácil separarse del resto. Pero ahí Esteban Chávez en la tercera posición en la subida. Esteban Chávez que podría también estarse contemplando dentro del podio en la clasificación general. Aquí va a haber una disposición de la bonificación. 10 segundos para el primero, 6 para el segundo, 4 segundos para el tercer lugar. Se empieza a quedar un poco la energía en las piernas. Richie Port quizá haya gastado un poco antes de tiempo, pero está tratando de mantenerse sobre los pedales para que este esfuerzo, su salida, no sea en vano. Se pone ahora Esteban Chávez. Y bueno, Isaguirre, es Gorka Isaguirre, entonces, el que tenemos aquí en la tercera posición. Richie, parece que está cómodo. No hay manera, creo que en este momento haya un recorte por parte de estos dos que están tratando de intercambiar el esfuerzo. Pero Esteban Chávez le va a dar a Colombia una muy buena posición en la clasificación general final del día. Una gran oportunidad de asalto, de bonificación, de un golpe de moral, de motivación. Él había ganado en Huilunga, pero ahora también va a sumar esta nueva cima a su palmarés. Y Gorka Izaguirre tiene que tener cuidado porque Esteban Chávez también puede pelearle esa segunda bonificación. 200 metros, Richie Ford viene por otra llegada en alto. Richie Ford esperará que en Huilunga se le vuelva a repetir este escenario, pero Richie Ford se va a quedar con la subida en Paracom, Australia, por segundo día consecutivo, victoria de etapa. Ahora para el equipo BMC, Richie Port, el hombre de Tasmania, gana la etapa. La que decían iba a ser la etapa reina. Qué manera de sacarle tiempo al resto de los favoritos. No va a ser fácil sacar del podio y del primer lugar a Richie Port. Gorka y Seguirre va por el segundo lugar. Tercero va a entrar Esteban Chávez, que aprieta los dientes. Un gran esfuerzo. Tercero para Esteban Chávez. Vamos a ver por dónde llega Sergio Luis Arrao, que acaba de entrar en este momento. Qué manera de resistir por parte de Sergio Luis Arrao. Me quito el sombrero porque el antioqueño hizo lo imposible. Regresó y quedó entre los primeros 12 de la etapa. Tremenda etapa la que acabamos de observar, Richie Port demostrando que conoce el terreno, pero que además tiene unas condiciones impresionantes y que arrancando año está muy en forma. Acariciando el liderato del Tour Down Under, 
Sport con un arranque explosivo. Finalmente sorprendió a todos. Muy bien por Esteban Chávez porque estuvo muy atento. No se explotó, no se exigió a fondo. Está tranquilo, sabe para qué vino a Australia. Y también Isa Aguirre que tuvo una excelente presentación para el Movistar. Y lo de Sergio Luis Senado prácticamente heroico porque sigue en la conversación pese a quedarse cortado antes de iniciar el ascenso. Que levante los brazos y que festeje. Preliminar 16 segundos de diferencia con el eh, segundo de la clasificación y un segundo más le sacaría a Esteban Chávez. Hay además que sumar allí las bonificaciones. Y hablaríamos de Richie Port poniéndose la camiseta ocre el día de hoy. Pero ya metiéndose al podio, un colombiano, Esteban Chávez y Saguirre, el español, también está ahí en posiciones de privilegio. La gran confianza que tuviste para atacar. Bueno, no lo he tenido en los últimos dos años. Eh, estrategias que no funcionaron. Y bueno, eh, yo tengo un equipo increíble, me cuidaron todo el día. La verdad es que eh, me enfrenté al viento, pero durante el día me cuidaron mucho. Bueno, decidiste hacer, hacer la salida antes de lo más duro. Bueno, es un poco triste que no se haya quedado conmigo eh, Rock and Dennis por lo de la avería mecánica. Pero todavía faltan algunas etapas. Eh, tengo que confiar en el trabajo de mi equipo y tengo mucha confianza. Te volteaste a ver un par de ocasiones para saber eh, cuál era la diferencia con los que perseguían. Eh, venía muy bien Wilco Kelderman, era el hombre que yo tenía oye, un poco visto en la subida. Y yo no quería que me sorprendieran. Así que me, me gusta este tipo de salida, lo hice con confianza y, su, y funcionó. Todavía mucho estrés en los próximos días. Y bueno, pues ahora hay que disfrutar del día de la victoria. Y si había que hacer el desgaste un día, lo hizo en el día correcto, porque pone bastante tierra de por medio con el resto de los favoritos. Y ahí está la clasificación.